All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Alternative Investor Mastermind. Uh, excited to have our guest today, Nancy Chu. Uh, Nancy, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Happy birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate you uh, doing this. Uh, you know, I know uh, we've been uh, in touch for a few years now and done some investing even through the fund. Uh, and it's just uh, great to connect and do a little deeper dive and learn a little bit, little bit more about your you and your business and also just your your what you you know how you look at investment opportunities so uh thanks for being here sure um yeah if you could just give your background yeah yeah (laughs) my name is nancy chu and i run a team uh, a real estate team called nancy chu homes uh the team itself has been around for about five years although i have been in business for 17 in the northern new jersey market primarily um i will tell you that We've had a couple of good years. The last year, we uh, closed about 168 units uh, at about 82 million, which is uh, nice. It puts us in the top, one of the top 20 uh, agents in the entire Garden State multiple listing. So we, we're busy. And I would tell you that the market last year was super busy and kept us going. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's great. That's great. So how did you break into... To real estate, uh, you, know, you said seventeen years. What what were what were you doing before, and what was the what was the transition like? You know, I, I will tell you that I actually went to school for theater, and uh, and it was really interesting because at the same time I developed a um, career in medical administration because I just happened to find a job that was a, an opportunity that allowed me to grow. And I got myself to a point where I said, I have to step away from theater at some point, right? Um, it, I wasn't going to make it to the show. So it seemed like a good idea to find something else to do. And I'm not sure that I thrive outside of running my own business, I, which I think a lot of people who are in business have that, have that bug, have that itch, right? You got to like run your own thing. So um, when I was looking to transition, we moved to Jersey I just could not stop looking at homes. And my husband was like, you know, you should just do this, right? Um, so I ended up getting my license. And I, I will remember, he, he teases me about this all the time. I, I say things like, oh my gosh, if I don't sell a house in our first year, are we going to be okay? I made sure that we had like enough money to cover it in case I didn't bring in any income. But my first year, I did 22 transactions. So we actually did okay. Well, that, that that's great. And uh, so you said seventeen years. So that's so uh, you started before uh, you know before the last crash. Uh, and you know, I get a lot of questions now about sort of what's happening in the world and and you know interest rates going up and and just potential risk of the business. Like how how do you look at what happened in two thousand eight versus what's happening now and what what are you seeing? Well, I, listen, I don't see the same thing. You know, you see a lot of news media out there saying things like foreclosures are coming. There's a tsunami of foreclosures. We all know that that's not actually true. We do not have, most everybody I know who purchased in the last 10 years have purchased with significant amounts of equity in their home. They are, you know, lending standards have been pretty harsh. So they're not really allowing people to do these things anymore, to do these low money down loans. So I'm not really worried. I think most people if you, especially if you add on top of the amount that their houses have grown just from the market itself, the likelihood is that no matter what they owe, they can actually probably sell the home and take their equity out of it rather than to lose the house to the bank and lose all the equity that they've gained. So it's really not the same. It's not the same market. This is, as my husband would say, this is a bread bubble because it's, it's, it's baked in. Bread bubbles don't burst like that. I like that. I like that. Um, yeah, and I, 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 I completely agree with you on and as someone who also lived through the crisis and was even buying loans uh, during the crisis. Um, you know, with that said, you know, interest rates have went up significantly, um, and, and I, I know in certain markets there is a little bit of a slowdown, at least from the the, the euphoria that there was with maybe multiple offers well above listing uh, or well above asking. Have you seen any sort of changes in in uh, you know the amount of the amount of offers, the amount, you know, are, are, are houses still trading and bidding wars above asking price, or has there been any change in the last 60 days or so? I, I would, I, I have to say yes. Um, but I am, I'm fully aware that being 12 miles west of the city, we have some insulation. I have colleagues all throughout the country and they're definitely starting to panic. You know, you can see them. We put the house on crickets two weeks in, three weeks in, you know, they're starting to 
recognize that, you know, the pricing has probably slowed down for them in other market areas, especially ones that are, you know, vacation, you know, that have vacation or investor uh, heavy, I think, markets. For us, because we are Northern New Jersey, we do have a direct pulse and direct sort of line to the city and the folks coming out of the city. So I would tell you that because our median price point in our market. If I look at Montclair, which is sort of where my office is based and sort of the, you know, the foundational uh, town for my market, um, you can see that, you know, just a couple of years ago, the median sale price in town was like 750, right? If I pulled up the median sale price today, I would tell you that it's probably closer to 1.1. And that's just two years of growth. Okay. So what it says to me is that I've had very little people truly step back in the upper price point. Does that make sense? So anything that's kind of in that 800 and above price point, they really haven't gone anywhere. But the truth is, I think that's because they may have been investors anyway, and in, in certainly in other places, and they are cash heavy, which means that they're putting down more cash. And the likelihood is that if they are looking to meet a monthly payment with their mortgage, then they may just sort of fill in the gap, right, with cash instead. So I don't really see much market movement in sort of that 800 plus range, but I will tell you that in that first time home buyer, that first time home buyer has definitely taken a pause. They have stepped back because the for those that didn't buy last year and who kind of waited and unfortunately missed the boat on the interest rate, many of them are looking at 3, 400, 700 dollars a square, 700 dollars a month difference in their mortgage payments. And that's just not, I don't know if that's tenable for, for some of them. Yeah. yeah. And those that did buy, you know, even if they put more money down, most of them locked in 30 year fixed. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the big difference between the last uh, 2008 and now is that those lending standards were tighter, but also these were not these option arm mortgages. There's 30 year fixed on, um, you know, Fannie Mae up to a certain level, but even through these non QM products or just portfolio loans for some of the you know, you know, million dollar houses, it's, it's available. And it although, wasn't. Although Jack, I have to say, you know, I do have clients now who are, who are looking because there are alternative loan products. There are so many alternative loan products. Um, actually, I'll tell you, I had a really interesting, I mean, granted, this isn't the case anymore because the jumbo product is such a, is so cheap now by comparison to what it was, you know, maybe like three months ago, but um I did have an interesting situation where I had a client who came in and they were looking initially at a jumbo loan. This was two and a half months ago when they were putting in their offer. And it was cheaper to put them into a conforming conventional, you know, loan at like 66%, right? And and fill the rest of it in with a piggyback loan, you know, a HELOC piggyback. It, that actually saved them, you know, compared to the jumbo back then, that saved them $1,000 a month. I'm wow. just saying the alternative loan product is definitely something that we're still as this conventional, you know, sort of interest rate goes higher, you know, we're starting to investigate seven year arms again, we're starting to investigate, you know, um, alternative loan product that can keep that monthly interest rate down. And I've said to my clients, if you cannot refi in the next seven years, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you should be able to get it together to refi in the next seven years. Because I've had people say, what if I don't make it? I'm like, it's seven years, for goodness sake. That's plenty of time to take care of it. And I know the market's going to have enough. Anyway, that's not the hammer there. Yeah. <laughs> like, I figured you'd get a laugh from that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's a great line. Um, so you obviously stay really busy with, uh, with the brokerage side of the business. What have you done as far as personal real estate investing? Well, you know, what's been really interesting, like, I'm not going to lie, this particular market has made it difficult. Um, there aren't as many good, delicious deals. It's funny, because like, I actually get like, you know, off proper, like off, you know, off market properties, they come through and none of them have good cap rates right now. <laughs> um, and so I have, opt it's funny, because my previous um, for the first, you know, maybe like 12 years, my husband and I used to do um, what I would call sort of slow flips. We would purchase a property well under median, you know, in that distressed property range. We would make sure to get it up and running enough that we could live in it. And then we would slowly flip it over time. And then we would wait for our, you know, capital gains to be done or close to done. And then we would sell it at the profit and, and piggyback our way into the next property. Um, we haven't really had much success in the last couple of years. Because any deals that we found, uh, maybe this is my failing, we've 
you know, funneled to our investors because honestly, I need to keep my investors fed. <laughs> so I have probably failed myself um, disappointingly. So we don't keep a lot of rental property at this point either because honestly, the the, <laughs> the retail portion of our business has been kind of, I believe, kicking my butt is the word for it. It's been really keeping us quite on our toes. So we really only have kept... You know, like three doors. And at this point we are um, looking around for funds because honestly, the, the less I have to actually hands-on manage the better right now for where we are. I don't know if you have that with your clients. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, it's a very, very typical story at this point. Uh, you know, we have a lot of investors that are, you know, tired landlords, um, you know, and busy professionals. And uh, you know, you, I think you fit into both categories. Because, uh, yeah, busy professional. And then maybe, you know, you, you have to kind of do it yourself enough to know that real estate, if you have one or two units, it's not truly passive. Uh, if you're part of 100 or 200, it's big enough that you have an economy of scale and it becomes uh, a little more passive. And that's, uh, that's a transition I've made over, you know, over a period of time as well. After having, I think I had 50 doors when I was in my mid 20s. And, uh, you know, I, if, if I had hair, it would be gray. From uh, probably from that experience. <laughs> well, uh, it's interesting because there are so many great markets right now. Well, technically, you know, we've been keeping our eye in like you know on Vegas in uh, like Louisville, Kentucky, for instance. There are some, I think, really fabulous markets that you can actually get really decent returns on, really decent rents on. Um, but I think the thing that I keep, I agree, I'm sort of at that point where I have to decide do I try to push myself into enough doors that it makes sense to hire the management company, et cetera, right? Because I agree up until a certain number, it's really just your hard work and your blood, sweat and tears. And in truth, I do think that for us, mm, having someone who has the infrastructure already in place that we just sort of slide right into, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm absolutely okay with that. Yeah, and it's very powerful. A full-time real estate broker qualifies as a real estate professional. Um, you know, when, when did you start realizing that on your tax returns? Is that something that uh, was part of your planning years ago, or is it something just as the as as the volume increased and the and the tax bills got higher, you you dove you know into it a little more? You know what's really interesting? So for many many years, I actually um, had a different like. For, I would tell you for the first ten years of my real estate career, I wasn't technically filing as a real estate professional because I also had, um, I was also writing and directing at the same time. So I had a different way to sort of write things off <laughs> and it actually sort of did good for my taxes. When I realized that that wasn't going to happen, I was pretty much going to step out of that world. Um, that's when we started looking around and I will be the first to tell you that as with many real estate agents who function um, you're so busy running around and just sort of doing business that you don't even think about it. I, I would tell you that for many, many years, I went to, uh, I've had a couple of accountants who I loved as people, but who in the end were not hugely aggressive and were really taking their cues off of me in terms of how aggressive to be and what direction we should go in and who were not proactive in terms of saying, how about we file an LLC? How about we do this? How about they weren't doing that. Let's talk about what, you know, how you should be filing. Let's talk about depreciation. We weren't having that. And it really wasn't until I'll be honest, like we, there was one year about, I guess, or about technically two, three years ago when the tax bill was so, it just took such a, a huge chunk out of us that you know, I sort of woke up and I said, we have to do something. You know, we have to go out and seek out better financial advisors, better accounting folks, just people who are going to help us make better decisions with our money. So ever since then, we have been working with, I think, higher level people. And that has been helping significantly in terms of because I mean, it's going to be another, it's going to be another chop of a tax bill this year. And we're working really hard to fit. What's funny, can I tell you something? I didn't even realize I hadn't thought about this, but I have ownership stake in two houses and in two houses that I didn't even remember that I technically was part of owner of and we could have utilized for tax purposes. Yeah. I feel like a real idiot. Yeah. Well, it's, so uh, this it's is, this not, is, is this, is this really a blog thing. about, is this like a podcast about what not to do? Is this like <laughs> a, am I like a cautionary tale for, 
all the dumb things that. <laughs> I think it's a great, it's a great way to learn. I think learn, you know, and that's part of a mastermind is to learn from others' mistakes and help each other. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not too late for 2022. It's the last year of bonus depreciation. So uh, we can talk offline about, uh, you know, if it makes sense to try to, you know, look at a cost segregation, even on those two properties, if that'll move the needle on the, on, on the tax situation for this year. The truth is I have to, I, I really need to pay for cost segregation. That's the truth. Um, we have been kind of, I, I would tell you that at this juncture, RAF probably has a slightly, but like I, in terms of work, moving forward, working with our new financial folks, I think that we have some plans in mind, which is good. Um, but the truth is right now, I am so, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm very focused on the retail side of real estate. Yeah. And that should be a majority of your focus and with the right team, you know, the playbooks, none of it's really rocket science once you have the right playbook. Um, for those that aren't the right team. fully aware, so cost segregation is an engineering study um, that can be done, whereas a traditional residential property, you have to take depreciation over 27 and a half years. But with cost segregation, uh, you hire an engineer to look at, okay, how much longer does the roof have? Uh, what about the cabinets? What about the heating and air conditioning? And uh, often some of those have five-year life cycles, three-year life cycles. And uh, our typical deal on the larger deals, you get about 30% of the value of mm. the property back the first year. And if you're borrowing at 65 or 70% loan to value, it can often be almost 100% of your investment coming back in right. depreciation. And when you're at the, the 37 to 50 percent tax bracket in uh, you know high tax states, it, it really can dry, it can save you a significant amount in taxes. So it, it's a very very powerful tool. And uh, you know often often for a small single family, if it's in the Midwest, for you know if it's a hundred thousand dollar property, it's probably not worth it. But if you're in an area where the values are close to a million dollars, it may be worth the seven thousand dollars to 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 do the engineering study if it saves you fifty thousand in taxes. Right. And especially if you're going to hold on to it, I think that's part of it is the, you know, and at this juncture, I think I'm from moving forward. I don't think I'm going to be selling anything. I think we're anything that we purchase, we're just going to hold forever and ever. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, well, so one, of, one, of, one of my other friends has a saying, refi till you die. That, that's yeah, his, that's pretty much. Pretty much. And just, and I mean, listen, houses are, they're, they're banks, they're storage banks, they're storage banks for funds. And the idea that it's a, you know, the idea that I could utilize it as a rotating credit source to fund other things. That's amazing. That's an amazing realization. That's something that I think a lot of real estate agents don't always understand and don't always know how to talk about um, with their investor clients, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, like you said before, I think often you get so focused on your own business that you just kind of, you just have to end up with that one track of mind and you end up on the hamster wheel and it's hard to take a step back and think about long-term wealth building um, and, and just the steps to, so can I ask you a question? Please. Just because you have an eye, just because you have an eye on a lot of different markets, you know, you as opposed to I'm very sort of focused on, you know, half of a state, right? You have your eye on a lot of different markets. What are you seeing out there in the other markets? Yeah, it's it sounds relatively similar that there's a little bit of a pullback, but it's really more coming down to earth than any sort of uh, you know, any sort of major crash. You know, there, there's markets with five, 10% corrections. Uh, there's a market where the average daily inventory went from what 30 days to 40 days, you know, still well below the, you know, the historic, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the exact numbers, but still most markets well below the historic inventory levels. Um, I'm in a mastermind group that has a Facebook uh, group and, uh, you know, the people from all different markets were posting and, you know, San Diego, everything except the super high end was still perfectly fine. Um, you know, I think the, the the middle the middle class middle market type properties really, you know, barely affected more than a few percent. The higher end of the market, where I think they, I think a lot of sellers were really just trying to stretch the market and see see what they can get. Um, that market is really seems to be what's come down to earth. And uh, you know, New York may be a little sheltered from that just because. That's so you know, interesting because that yeah. what you're describing it's so funny because I was just in San Diego teaching and at a market center in San Diego and I have to tell you it's kind of the opposite of us. Our higher end has stayed sort of fluffy and healthy, um, while our lower end has definitely suffered more. It's really uh, interesting because I feel like most of our market went from. I mean, you have to understand that for. November and December were very active for us this year, this past this past year, which is usually a sign 
for me, it's a sign that January, February are going to be kind of crazy, right? Um, because it means that no one's taking a break. They're all just sort of pushing through the holiday season to try to get into something maybe before the end of school, before summer starts, right? So we've gone from, you know, very lovely, you know, 1800 square foot houses coming onto the market in a market like Montclair and having 25 to 37 ish you know, offers on that property. That property then performs. So for instance, let's say the house is listed for 929 and it sells for about 1.45, right? That's been our market. Those are the ratios. As a matter of fact, the ratios have even moved higher at this point. So the thing that I thought was really interesting about it is that the houses are still performing at the same ratios, even if you only get three to seven offers. So I'm going to assume that what we've got now is the people who are very good, um, who are, I shouldn't say good, but the people who have really good financials, right? The ones who were um, capable of ex- sort of playing in this market in the first place, they're still there. They're still there. They're players and they can still do it. But a lot of folks, I think, were just throwing offers at properties with, oh, I don't know how much hope they had, or maybe they were not informed of the kind of performance the market was going to have. So I think that you've got a lot of folks in that 20, you know, 25 to 37 range who are putting in offers maybe around a million, a million one, a million two, thinking, oh, I'm, this should be fine. It, instead, I think that the three that are remaining are just as good as the top ones from before. So we're not seeing a numbers movement. We're really, really not seeing a numbers movement on the even if the reduction in offers. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. This is a little bit of a separate topic, but it just came up in, in conversation yesterday that the Hamptons rental market, and I'd imagine the Jersey Shore rental market is down significantly. I think this is more of a, the last couple of years, people weren't traveling internationally because of COVID and they were just you know spending their money on you know uh, Hamptons rental. But I, I, I heard from someone who has some property out there that uh, they're down about 30% from the rents for last year. And that just leads me to think people are finally traveling you know, taking that Europe vacation that they were putting off for two years or going, going somewhere else other than just staying, staying in, in, in a rather than staying in, rather than staying in an isolate. I think that, you know, a beach rental is great if you want to keep other people away from you, but I agree. It feels like we've just gone right back to normal. Once they lifted the mask mandates on the planes, I think it's given sort of permission for everyone to fly free. So I agree. Everyone seems to be traveling all over the place now. I'm excited. I've got two trips to Europe this summer myself. So <laughs> that's great. I'm I'm taking very sad short trips, like day trip, like you know, like weekend trips and stuff, because we're just um, not able to leave. We're just not really able to leave the business right now. So um, once again, a good problem to have. I should not. Complain. Yeah, you know, gr- yeah. When when things are good, you you grind and you know, just continue to build the <laughs> passive income. Um, so what else do you do besides, uh, are you into anything besides real estate? Have you dabbled in crypto or what are your thoughts on some of this other? So I, I think we have like a piece of some crypto, like it's like, probably, <laughs> I think we have like, you know, I, if it were a chocolate coin, we'd break it up into a tiny little piece and it would end up looking like a speck on the ground. Um, so, you know, what's interesting, I would tell you that for both Raf and myself, you know, for both my husband and, and I, you know, we are of that generation that probably was not initially comfortable with the concept of crypto. Does that make sense? You know, in all honesty, I, I will tell you, I, I'll be completely honest with you. My first two properties that I purchased, I purchased entirely with cash. I wasn't even comfortable with lending initially. I would tell you it's probably partially cultural and partially the age bracket that I'm in. I'm older than you think. And generationally, I would tell you, we were not stupendously comfortable with the concept of lending, right? And I see that just, you know, with my clients all the time, I have older clients who are, who, you know, who are like, where's my cash offer? I just want that cash offer. Because they see that as true stability, as opposed to, you know, um, mortgages, which they sort of, I, I would tell you, they have unusual ideas of what mortgages are, right? They, they, they think it's a negative. They find it negative as opposed to younger generation. You know, these folks that are millennials in their thirties, they look at this and they say money is so cheap, even at 6%. 
it is still well below, right, the national average of, you know, historical national average of like seven, seven and a half percent. So they look at it and they're like, this is cheap money. I'd much rather, you know, borrow at this percentage than take my money out of, you know, the, the market where it's making more, right? So it's it's been really interesting. I will be the first to tell you that, you know, we came to this game a little bit late on the other stuff because, uh I've had to train myself to think like a slightly younger person, I guess. That's probably a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, I was really not, and I, I have a small amount of crypto personally, but moving down to Puerto Rico, I'm surrounded by crypto enthusiasts, uh, some, of, some of whom bought at $200 a coin and, you know, have become multimillionaires. Uh, you know, some of them, and in some of them, it was dumb luck. Some of them were, you know, I know a few poker players that, and I don't want to say it's dumb luck, but because poker became illegal, they were getting paid in Bitcoin. And because of that, they, and this was back in maybe 2012, uh, whatever, there was a point where online poker was outlawed and now it's back, you know, so some of them just kind of fell into it because of that. Others were just into the technology and, uh, you know, really not finance driven people or money driven people, but just were into the technology and the, the decentralized nature of it and just sort of found wealth because they, we're interested into it as a hobby. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly a crypto enthusiast myself, but you know, I, I, I spend a lot of my time researching different opportunities. So it's been, it's, it's been interesting. And I, you know, I, I think that's maybe a one to 2% of the wealth of your wealth could be in it, you know, as far as a hedge in case there's, you know, some catastrophic change in the world order in the, in the coming years. But yeah, it's something I'm not, you know, I, I don't get distracted. It's like, there's only so many things you can do at once. I, I tend to focus on, cash flowing investments, uh, you know, including all these real estate syndications and uh, just really other things that um, spit off positive cash flow. I agree. I agree. I was going to say there's a bandwidth problem, right? That's part of it is that there's a bandwidth issue and there's so many things. It's so funny because even right now, um, my son is talking about things that I don't quite understand. Like, I don't, I, like art that they, art that they make on the internet. Like I'm like art that exists in the, in, in the ether, I, I'm, and what that's worth, and my son's producing that. I, I, all I can say is that I don't have the bandwidth for it right now, although I am intrigued by it. Um, but I do see that there is going to be, you know, people are starting to purchase homes with crypto. I mean, that is definitely coming down the pike. I haven't seen it by us, but you do see it out in California and it's starting to happen. Yeah. And lending. I think I just saw a recent uh, advertisement for a company that will lend against a crypto portfolio to turn it into cash so that you can buy a house and then they secure the house and a portion of your crypto portfolio, I guess that's collateral. So um, th things are, are changing um, and real estate's changed a lot as well. Um, you know, 17 years, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we've been in about the same time. I mean, you know, you'd still send maybe mailers, uh, maybe Craigslist was just getting started on the internet. Like, how do you, how are you, you mentioned training in San Diego, like how, what is your advice or how are you training new agents that are coming into the business on sort of how to make their mark in the current market? I have to say, I don't know why anybody's coming into the market right now. That sounds, uh, it's, <laughs> that's, it's not meant to be negative. It's just, a, it, this market is moving so fast. It moves much, much faster than folks who, I, I would tell you, I'm almost at a disadvantage in some ways because I've been in the market for so long. So I have in my head what I think is a normal way in which the market functions. Some of the young whippersnappers that are coming in, they don't have that, you know, they're not, they have no expectations. So they're just moving at the pace of the market. Um, the truth is, I would tell you that there's four significant ways in which any agent who's starting to work right now needs to be focused. And they need to be focused on lead generation, right? Historical, economic historical and anthropological economic data. Does that make sense? I think, you know, that is huge right now. Understanding um, how people relate to money is, I think, a huge part of being able to work with clients moving forward. Um, the, and understanding metrics and how to, I would tell you right now, I keep such a significant set of records on not only performance metrics for myself and my team, but also all the performance metrics for all the major towns that we work in, um, and how the market is moving in general. And last but not least, I would tell you that I'm always looking for some sort of growth pathway for other things and other opportunities. You cannot be in, listen, this is now a business of, of where people have taken lead aggregators, right? 
you look at the Zillow's, you look at the Realtor, Trulius, et cetera, they're lead aggregators and they've managed to find a way to wedge themselves between me and my client, right? So I have to figure out how to live and work with these lead aggregators. And at the same time, I need to make sure that the people who are coming to me understand that I am better than his estimate, right? That I am better, that I have more value than a, a straight on estimate. Although I think, you know, we all know that Zestimates cause Zillow to have a significant loss <laughs> <laughs> with their iBuyer program. So, you know, so maybe it's not hard to believe that I'm better than his estimate, but those are sort of the four pillars of training right now. And I think that you really, there's so many, because of the aggregators, there's so many people with their hands in your pocket. Does that make sense? Like they're taking nipples and chunks off of, you know, you're definitely not making as much money per transaction as you used to. So it's really important now to be looking for ancillary businesses that are, you know, sideways to and in, in tangential to the real estate world so that, um, so that you have other pipelines for income. To be honest, you need other pipelines for income right now. Um, at least I would tell you that, you know, agents who are kind of in that growing, developing group, there's too many hands in the till. So that's what we're looking for. Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting. It's like a double-edged sword of the, you know, the access to information is, is about as free as it ever was, but it's not free because the, they all have their hands in your pocket for a few dollars here and a few dollars there for uh They do. Generation. They do. It's really, it's like James the Giant Peach. Like I'm like, you know, I'm taking little chunks out of you all the time. So um, yeah, although I would tell you that this is, you know, anyone who's coming into this business, they better want to be in business for themselves. They better want to be thinking in a business minded fashion. That is, I think, a huge part of having success in real estate right now. I think a lot of people come in and they, they view the houses as the product. They view the house is not the product. I am the product. <laughs> I'm the product. The house is the the widget in which we you know sell my product. Yeah, that that's 100 percent true. And I, I've had my license. I was mostly doing investment sales, but I'd showed some friends some houses here and there. And I remember catching myself saying, like, I'm not going to talk someone into liking the house. Yeah, 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 they know they know when they see the kitchen or the bathroom or whatever. You know, they have a vision of a certain living room or a man cave or a she shed or whatever it is. <laughs> that, that that's what sells the house. Not you know, it's you're there as an advisor and and uh, you know to well, guide them and provide the help and provide the data that they need to make a decision. Well, I was going to say it's an interesting thing because I it's I, I say to my clients very plainly, I I really don't care about the house. You need to pick the house that makes you happy. Okay, I mean, if, if it's structurally, you know, if there are really questionable issues about it, I will let you know. But this is about the house that you want. So I could give a rat's patootie, whether it's a Tudor or a Victorian or a ranch, whatever it is that you want. But however, I do care about how much it's listed for, what the price per square foot is, what I think the median in the neighborhood is, what I think we have to go to in order to win it, et cetera. So I am 100% on board with you. It's not about the, I, I'm not looking at beautiful archways and lovely surface deck. Um, I'm trying to figure out whether this house is going to be a really good part of your overall investment portfolio. Even if it's the home that you're going to choose to live in, you know, and it's going to be your personal primary home, it still needs to play a part as part of your overall real estate portfolio. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Cool. Well, as we uh, as we get uh, kind of towards wrapping up here, what what are your goals for uh, for the rest of the year or or the next twelve months in uh, you know, business and investing? You know what's interesting? What's really interesting is there has been some talk about, um, how do I say this nicely? There's been some talk in the real estate world for those of us who coach and mastermind with other um, sort of high level realtors that if you can maintain in 2022, you're doing pretty well. Does that make sense in terms of you know dollar volume units, et cetera? Uh, so I think there's some expectation that people are going to pull back and perhaps, you know, cut and trim fat and maybe be a bit miserly with their money. I, I understand that impulse because there is a whole lot of, well, we don't know what's happening kind of feeling, but at the same time, it's kind of like, you know how Warren Buffett, what's the quote, the Buffett quote, that's like, you know, that you should be greedy when others are, you know, wary, et cetera. Yeah. And it's really interesting because it feels like the truth is it's always a good time to purchase real estate. Because all you have to do is find real estate that is selling it under the median. Whether it's whatever the flaws are with it, the condition, et cetera, all that stuff is changeable. All that stuff is fixable. 
right? Okay, you can't change it if it's located in like, you know, the, the middle island, of, you know, on the median of this, you know, on a highway strip. So maybe you can't change that, right? But, but if you purchase in that below the median, you know, for that neighborhood, if you purchase that way, you're always going to have a good deal in comparison to what other people are doing, right? And how that, and how that market is performing. So I don't know, I sort of feel like there's opportunity here. We've talked about the idea that we'd like, you know, we had hoped to, you know, add a couple of investment properties this year. I would tell you that we're halfway through the year and we have not yet found something that we'd like to, um, you know, a couple of multifamilies would be nice. Um, We're not seeing it. There's no cap rates on them. So I'm recognizing that I have to leave the area. I can't invest in my own market area right now. There really just aren't any opportunities that there aren't any opportunities at the level that I would like them to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think a lot of people are in the same boat and, and just demographically, I mean, people are moving to the Southeast, people are moving to the Sun Belt, people are moving to Florida. Um, there was a panel I, I listened to that had Barry Sternlicht and a few other you know big time real estate billionaires and just everybody was just still bullish, so bullish on Florida, yep. just uh, business climate demographics. And uh, I mean, people have been moving to Florida for, you know, for a generation, you know, but it's now it's not the, it's, it's not the seniors anymore too. It's, uh, no, it's everyone in their twenties that can work remotely. And, uh, there's opportunities there. Yeah, there definitely is a business, you know, uh, you know, the mayor of Miami was recruiting people for company, you know, recruiting everything from Bitcoin to just financial companies. Uh, Goldman's moving down to Palm beach, or at least their wealth management division. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that COVID has maybe unlocked is, you know, it's not that the offices are dead by any means, but I think maybe 10 to 20% of people will work remote and certain companies that might have been tied to certain markets are going to be more open to having, you know, branch or satellite offices in different places to, to better recruit talent. It'll be interesting to see how that affects commercial property in secondary and tertiary markets. Don't you agree? Like, I feel like secondary and tertiary markets, you know, Cleveland, you know, towns like that are going to be where you're going to see, because it makes more sense to have, you know, one smaller large city hub, right. And then have satellite offices in and centered and clustered around these secondary. Oh, absolutely. Markets. Absolutely. And, and especially in the tech space where you know, Silicon Valley is, you know, largely unaffordable, even for, right. you, know, if you, you're, you could be an entry level programmer and starting at 200,000 plus, and you know, you're still similar to New York, you're, 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 you're getting a roommate or you're getting a, you know, 400 yeah, square foot studio, but uh, <laughs> you know, you could then recruit from Pittsburgh, you know, Carnegie Mellon engineering graduates or computer science graduates that, you know, maybe end up at a satellite office in Pittsburgh and they, they make half the money, but that's a, you know, very good wage for, for, for Pittsburgh. Uh, well, I was going to say, it feels like it's going to increase the productivity too. I feel like, you know, not taking them, not taking people out of their home environments is probably a good productivity booster. For instance. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think there's a way to do it. Certainly just, just working from home. If you're sort of first year out of college, I think, you know, it helps to have some type of office culture and training and mentorship with certain right. senior employees, but yeah, a satellite office where you're, you know, in a more livable market where you could still have those growth opportunities and opportunities to you know work with a team while not having to operate yourself and, uh, you know, commute two hours a day from the right. far edges of the East Bay, oh, because that's the only place you could afford. Right. <laughs> I don't have, oh, I don't have the stomach for that. I'm too old. <laughs> I, I never, I grew up in Jackson, New Jersey and saw my parents and my parents' friends commute an hour and a half each way. And from the start, oh, I said, I don't want to commute. So you know, I'd rather live in a smaller place and, and have a 15 minute commute and have two hours of my day. And, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to, you know, limit my commutes for most of my time. Well, I was going to say, it sounds like you're the best right now. Puerto Rico is kind of the best. I mean, come on. Uh, it, it was it was an amazing trade to to move from New York in 2018. You know, got out just in time, avoided the whole uh, you know COVID thing, and uh, yeah, it's 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 been great for me, and it's uh, you know, it's kind of revitalized my my life, and I'm super happy uh, down here, and really just with my new business. Uh, you know, spending my time talking to uh, you know cool investors like you. Uh, you know that you look permanently tan and happy all the time, right? Like just so you know, you look permanently like tannish and happy. Oh, nice. I, I, I did take off my shades, but I had my shades on uh, before I had a big word podcast appropriate. Um, so but uh, yeah, it's really great to uh, to connect up again and, and chat. Um, hopefully we can uh, do this again uh, at some point in the future. And uh, do you Absolutely. have any closing thoughts? Uh, no, except, um, yeah, let's, I don't know. What's your next fund? Talk to me. 
uh, we'll do that later. We always have opportunities going. And then, uh, as I said, I will uh, follow up afterwards. Uh, you know, there's a cost seg vendor that we've used for a number of our deals and they'll actually give you a free quote, uh, okay, you know, just okay. a simple, they'll do a back of the envelope for you. Uh, to give you an idea of what what they think you might get, and then you can decide if it's worth. Uh, you know, it sounds like it will be, but uh, I'll, I will right. set you up with that. And uh, okay. um, great. Well, uh, hope everyone enjoyed uh, this episode of the Alternative Investor Mastermind. Please uh, leave us a review on uh, iTunes, Spotify, or your platform of choice, or and subscribe on YouTube. And Nancy, thanks again. Uh, it was really a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, Jack. <laughs>